I've always loved that week that begins with Christmas and ends with New Year's. I, for, for me, it's, it's, been a, it's always been a great week. There's always a possibility of being with your family. Uh, if you had a crummy year, you're looking forward to the next one. If you had a great year, you decide you're on a roll. And so you, you anticipate another great year. But for all the good things that week stands for, for all the optimism, for all the hope, there is, there is one negative. Historically, that is a very difficult garbage week. <laughs> Am I right? On the one week when a couple of garbage pickups would be great, we find ourselves on the holiday schedule which is admittedly a very happy sounding thing, a holiday schedule, but we all know it is code for, yeah, we'll get to your garbage as soon as we can. And it's usually not too soon. A few years ago, uh, our next door neighbor gave us one of the best Christmas gifts we'd ever received. Have never received it again. She left town and so we commandeered her garbage can. <laughs> Bro, we had two of them big rascals. That was awesome. Here's the essence of the problem at the Morris home, and I think Patty would agree. This may not be your problem, but it, it, it happens to be our problem. Our house cannot hold any more stuff than what it has exactly right now. Our house is maxed out with stuff. Not too long ago, we discovered that we had squirrels in the attic. I was never worried. I knew they'd move out when they realized how crowded it is. <laughs> up there. And, and for years, and I've said this before this time of year, I've advocated a weigh-in system for our house. For instance, any new Christmas items brought in the front door should be weighed in the entry hall, and the identical tonnage should be shoved out the back door. That way, garbage doesn't pile up where we live. It, I mean, it's a simple system. Christmas present would be delayed until Christmas passed, it's purged. I've always advocated this system, but it, it's never really been instituted. But it's really not a bad idea. In fact, it's really not a bad rule of thumb for life. Because some of us have some garbage in our lives that we need to clean up. We need to shove some of our personal garbage out the back door, out with the old. A, a, a psychiatrist friend of mine in another state told me of a woman that he had encountered in his community years ago. She was quite elderly and had become more and more of a recluse as the years had, had passed. No one had been in her home in many, many years when my psychiatrist friend's wife, one afternoon in compassion, made a visit to the woman's house. And the wife hurried home and persuaded her husband to return immediately with her to the old woman's house. What he found there was newspapers, thousands and thousands of newspapers, 45 years of newspapers stacked neatly throughout the house. Her lovely and spacious home had been reduced to a narrow pathway that was walled on either side with garbage. Garbage to us, but in some odd way, treasure to the old woman. But her treasure was killing her. There's a woman in Luke's gospel who brings to Jesus a life that is lined with garbage. Now Luke, Luke calls her a woman who had lived a sinful life. That may be kind. Scholars assume her to be a prostitute. That's a lot of stacked up newspapers right there. Her story is in Luke 7, and we looked at a little bit of it earlier. It begins in verse 36. It says, now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And she wiped them with her hair and kissed them and poured perfume on them. 
When the Pharisee who'd invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he'd know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. And Jesus answered him. And you may remember, he didn't say that out loud. He was thinking it. And, and Jesus answered him. He said, Simon, I have something to tell you. He said, tell me, teacher. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, which was in that day was equal to a full day's wage. And the other, uh, uh, 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? And Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. And Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. That's a fascinating story to me. You know what's happening in the last few verses of this passage, don't you? Jesus and this lady have opened the back door, and they're unloading trash. I've always wondered how she ended up there that day with Jesus. I don't know. It's obvious that she hadn't just stumbled upon Jesus that day. You don't just walk into some stranger's house and wash a man's feet with your tears and dry them with your hair. She had some information about Jesus. I would imagine that she had heard him teach. Or perhaps she had seen him heal. Maybe she had heard him speak a few days earlier in the chapter just before. Jesus had been teaching and he had said these words. Maybe she heard him. He said, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now for you will laugh. And so when she gets in his presence, the tears come. And they pour down on the feet of Jesus and they mingle with the perfume that she's pouring from her trembling hands. Maybe it's time to do a garbage interview and an inventory in our lives. Maybe we need to swing that back door open and start lugging our trash out. And, and you know what? Cleaning up is a great way to end a year and start a new one. So let's take a few minutes and look at four practical ways to begin a cleanup program in our lives. Here's the first one. Here's the out with the old, in with the new program. Step number one, recognize your rubbish. Recognize your rubbish. Different people carry different garbage. I, I, it's always been fascinating to me that archaeologists get most excited when their digs discover an ancient culture's garbage heap. You realize that? Artwork, pottery, tools are fine. And they are ecstatic when, when they see them. But they lose their minds when they find a pile of garbage. Because our garbage will never lie. A culture's garbage defines it. And unfortunately, sometimes our garbage defines us. Essentially, our garbage is our sin. Here's, here's a good definition of sin, if you're looking for one. That's not why you came, but that's what you're going to get. Things we do and attitudes we have that entangle us, hurt others, and bring dishonor to God. You probably know full well what your sins are. I sure know mine. Most of us have been, been carrying them around for years. Hate. Lust, selfishness, deception, addiction, bitterness, racism, whatever. And some of us carry garbage that we don't want to own. We say, we say things like this, 
I'm like I am because my father abused me. Or because my mother was an alcoholic. Or because my school teacher belittled me. That's their sin. It's not mine. Well, let me say this. You are right. And they will have to answer for their garbage. But their problem becomes your problem when you refuse to address the shambles that your life has become. At some point, we need to quit blaming somebody else for our alcoholism or for our anger or for our lust or our lies and say, now, I'm an alcoholic or I'm out of control or I'm a pathological liar. Recognize the rubbish in your life. 1 John 1, 8 says this, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You know what else we have a tendency to do? We become experts in identifying everybody else's garbage. Isn't that right? Isn't that what Simon the Pharisee did? You know what a Pharisee was? A Pharisee was a religious person of Jesus' day who worked passionately to keep the law of the Old Testament and to call for society around him to do the same. Pharisees take a beating in the New Testament. But, but you know, they weren't horrible people, really. In, track, in fact, they were trying to be very good people, weren't they? But somewhere along the way, they had come to decide that loving God was best defined by always doing the right thing and that doing the right thing on the outside was more important than being the right person on the inside. So we find Simon the Pharisee sitting back watching the spectacle of this woman and saying, saying this to himself in verse 39. If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. And Jesus says, he knows what Simon's thinking. He says, that's well and good, Simon. And he says, but are you open to a little observation? Jesus said, listen, I came as a guest to your home. You not put one drop of water on my feet. Which, by the way, is the minimal gesture of hospitality in that culture. But she wets my feet with her tears, dries them with her hair. You've not welcomed me with a kiss. She's not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil as is the custom when you have an honored guest like, like the teacher there, she pours perfume on my feet. He says, therefore I tell you, her many sins that you are so eager to point out, they are forgiven for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. So Simon the Pharisee was so quick to point out this woman's brokenness. But Simon hadn't even considered how he had ignored and offended Jesus. And so, so Jesus is really telling Simon that her sins were not keeping her from Jesus. This woman's life is represented so beautifully in step number two. Realize, it, realize that you are never too bad for Jesus. Realize that you are never too bad for Jesus. This sinful woman had the gall to crash a dinner party at a preacher's house because she knew the truth of this statement. She knew it. You are never too bad for Jesus. Years ago, I went with another one of our pastors here to pick up a guy who was in a bad space and down on his luck. And we were transporting him to a bus stop. And he was a mess. We were taking him. He was catching a greyhound. He, he had a look of a hard life on him. And during our ride, he spoke about his mother's faith. And his mother-in-law's faith. And then he recalled a time in his own life when he was 16. He was very active in the church at the time. And said at that point, probably 20 or 25 years earlier, that he had thought seriously about a life in ministry. Then he kind of shook his head and he said this. Sometimes that thought comes back, but after all I've done, and his voice trailed off. Every once in a while in the sermon series, the preaching team will walk us through a biblical hall of fame. Just a practical reminder of our rich heritage 
as followers of God. And in, those, in that series, we'll be reminded that Moses was a murderer, that David was an adulterer and a murderer, that Noah was a drunk, that Peter wasn't perfect before or after he met Jesus. You are never too bad for Jesus. God isn't looking for a bunch of saints. He's looking for sinners who want a revolution in their lives. That's a whole different deal. This woman came to Jesus filthy with sin. And what are his, what are his last three comments to her? Go find them in the passage and you circle them if you would. Here they are. Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. In her wildest imagination, do you think that's what she was expecting to hear? Can you imagine the healing that was taking place in her life? And you realize that her tears came well before Jesus said any of this. Her tears came as she was washing his feet. You know why she was crying? She was crying not because Jesus touched her, but because Jesus would let her touch him. See, that is deep to me. So number one, recognize your rubbish. Number two, realize you're never too bad for Jesus. Then step number three, lay your garbage at Jesus' feet. Lay your garbage at Jesus' feet. There's an, there's an unfortunate cultural problem here. When we read this account in Luke's gospel, because such an example of humility and servanthood as exhibited by the washing of Jesus' feet is really non-existent in our culture. What, what she did seems almost bizarre in this day and age. But in her culture, she is speaking volumes. And, and I, I think that we can begin to understand her heart when we see her, her actions positionally. How does, how does she begin to position herself that day? Two things. To walk toward Jesus, she had to walk away from her sinful past. To walk toward Jesus, she had to walk away from her sinful past. She had to repent of her sins. The theological concept of repentance is very simply to turn away. To leave your sins at the door. Because you see, repentance is not just acknowledging your sins. That's confession. But repentance is acknowledging them and turning from them. I remember a friend of mine years ago who stumbled into the path of a skunk one day while we were out at a camp in Moscow, Tennessee. And when he returned to the cabin, we made him leave his clothes in a pile on the porch before we'd let him in. It wasn't good enough for him to acknowledge or confess that he smelled like a skunk. He had to turn from smelling like a skunk. This woman was in the process of leaving her sins, her garbage, by the door. When she positioned herself facing Jesus, she was turning her back on the streets. Then she positions herself in another way. She positions herself humbly. She positions herself humbly at the feet of Jesus. You see, the washing of feet was reserved for servants. And that's exactly what she aspired to be that day, to become a servant to the master who had freed her. That's what freaked out the disciples at the, at the Last Supper. Remember that? Jesus started washing their feet, and it freaked them out. No, 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 not you. Let, let me do you. But that's, that's not the way it worked. She knew all too well the truth of 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from every wrong. So we recognize our rubbish. We realize we're never too bad for Jesus. We lay our garbage at Jesus' feet. And then what? Step number four. Keep your heart clean. Keep your heart clean. The lady who filled her home with 45 years of newspapers. The next day, the day after they hauled those papers out, 
could either be the first day of a newspaper-free life or what? It could be the first day of her stacking up papers again. How many times in your life have you vowed to start all over again or quit doing whatever it is that's destructive in your life? You even hauled away the garbage and accepted God's forgiveness. And two months later or two days later, the truck that hauled that garbage away is sitting in your driveway, bringing it all back. You've made a couple of calls and got all that junk back. And you want to do right. You want to do right. You want to bring honor to God in the way you live. My old friend Bruce Carroll gave me a great sweatshirt years ago. I had admired the one that he had on, so he got me one just like it. On the back it said this, Lord, help me to be as good a person as my dog thinks I am. <laughs> that's not in the Bible, but that's a pretty good verse right there. How can we fence our lives from the trash that keeps driving up and down our street looking for us? Well, that's a great question. And, and the answer to it for many of us is the key to a victorious life. For some of us, it calls for radical change. We got to quit drinking or drugging. We got to pick up the phone first thing Monday morning, get in a treatment, or get, start some counseling. Or we have to stop the affair that we are in, and we need to stop it today. Now, see, that's radical, life-changing, I'll never be the same kind of stuff. For some of us, that's what's on the books for us. But for some of us, it's just not that radical. We may need to deal with a bit of anger problem or a struggle with pride or a problem with being critical. But whatever it is, however big or small, we need to keep our hearts clean for Christ. Okay, you ready for some practical help in keeping the garbage and the clutter out of your life once you cleaned it out? There is a verse in Philippians that was one of my mom's favorite verses. She was a practical lady, and this is a practical verse. It's Philippians 4 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Focus on those things. How about that? How about taking that list and focusing on that kind of stuff instead of the foolishness we focus on? Amen. Amen. We need to clean the garbage out of our lives and then refill our lives with a whole new set of good things, things that are pure and true and noble and right and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. You know, that's really what God did at Christmas. He gave us a chance to start over. He looked at a world piled with garbage and sent a Savior to clean up our mess and to give us the tools to keep that mess away for good. It ain't easy. I know it's hard. But there's no better thing to devote your life to than to live like that. Because how's the other life going? Pretty good? Not good at all. And listen, let me tell you something. There's a lot of people in here. There's a lot of people online. I'm preaching to this dude tonight. I got to listen to this. Let's pray before I break into tears, okay? <laughs> Father God, we thank you uh, that you love us so much that you don't want us to live like this. Father, that you came to this place to redeem the foolishness that we have found ourselves in. Father, I love that passage. I, and I, I, I love the fact that this lady was so vulnerable. She was so bold. And you were so sweet and good to her. 
Father, you're the same Jesus that that lady encountered, and we, we, we need to encounter you as well. So, Father, meet us this year as maybe we clean up that house in our hearts that we take some things out the back door and we put those beautiful things from Philippians to replace them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We love to pray for you and celebrate alongside you. Please share anything going on in your life with us at hopechurchmemphis.com slash prayer and subscribe to the Hope Church Memphis YouTube channel to experience previous worship services and more. Have a great week.